I'm glory bound by Jesus to see. Glory to God, He set me free. Goodbye to sin and things that confound. Not of this world shall turn me around. Daily I'm working, I'm praying to. Glory to God, I'm going through. He set me free, yes, He set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound my Jesus to see. Glory to God, He set me free. He set me free, yes, He set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound my Jesus to see. And glory to God, He set me free. For years, ever since I've been here, I've been taking notes. I got more notes than I can preach. <laughs> but I'm thankful to the Lord that this, Paul wrote to the church and he said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Yes. Scripture says creature, but that's what it means. And uh, there's just something about God's creative acts and how he does things. And then there's another thing that's a hallmark of being a Christian, and that's being obedient to God. And when you read the roll call of the heroes of faith in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, it talks about Abraham. The Bible said that he obeyed by faith. He obeyed God, and the scripture said he knew not whither he went. And I've known about that scripture. There's been times I didn't know where I was going. When we came up here, I didn't know where, what was going to happen. Yeah, we went to church at Mercy Tabernacle, and I sat outside the door one day, and I looked. It was a day kind of like today, maybe a little sunny. And I sat out there because I got a hearing problem, and music was very loud there, so I always had to go outside, and I sat out there, and I asked myself, look at what have you done? And we had come from Alabama, which we stayed there, lived in there for the better part of 50 years. And I, like you, I started in Catholicism, got married in a Southern Baptist church, and got the Holy Ghost in a Pentecostal assembly. And it's been really a lot of it. Sometimes I didn't know where I was going. And, but I was reading a scripture in the book of Genesis. I've read the Bible through six times since we've been here. And uh, I get something new. This is what the scripture says. And I'm thankful to God for his leadership. That's my testimony. And it came to pass when God, and the scripture says, caused me to wander from my father's house. And that stuck out to me that why would God cause Abraham to wander? And when you look at the word caused, uh, it strongs exhaustive concordance. Uh, has the word vacillate, and of course, I period, E period, that's Latin for that is, caused me to uh, go astray. Figuratively, that's what it means. And I know that God wouldn't cause us to go, to go astray. So when you study the scriptures out and bring them to bear, oftentimes we feel like we are wandering. And God will put us in a place to see what we're going to do. And Abraham is known as the father of the faithful. And he's also known as a friend of God. And friend, if you're a friend of God and you feel like you're wandering, you're not. Because the scripture said, he will lead me and guide me. If I acknowledge him in all of my ways, he'll lead and direct my paths. 
And so I looked at that and I thought, during this crisis that we're living in, I'm not alarmed. I mean, I'm amazed at how people can react to certain situations because when you go through a trial or a situation and you don't understand it and you begin to be presumptuous and start thinking thoughts that you normally don't think, next thing you know, you're going to be on a mental path that God never designated you to walk on. And so we need to understand that in this world, God's leadership is first and foremost. Another thing that came, occurred to my mind, and I'm thankful for God's leadership because I can't rely on my own instincts. Even though he has given us common sense, and there's sometimes you need to have common sense. Other times, you kind of throw it to the wind because faith, if you're not careful, you're calm. Sometimes you can override what faith wants you to do. And so pertinent to Abraham, Abraham, he says, he caused me to wander. But when you read in Hebrews 11th chapter, by faith he obeyed, not knowing whither he went. If we're obedient to God just by not seeing the proof. Now the Bible says in Hebrews the 11th chapter, verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 2 says, For by it the elders obtained a good report. And when you start going through all the scripture verses in Hebrews the 11th chapter, you're going to find that something's going to line up with your life that's going to speak to you loud and clear. And I just want you to know I have made up my mind that I'm going to serve God we can be down and out. We can be up on top of the mountain. But whatever, wherever place we're at, we can be in church or out there in the world. I have made up my mind that I'm going to be led by the Spirit of God. I can make my plans, but I'm going to do what God has asked me to do. I prefer him above everything else in my life, including my wife. I remember, Sister West, you remember that time when... You were getting ready to leave. She got in a car. She wasn't in the church. She ran away from me. And the car was in bad shape. Thank God for a bad shape car. And she came back. But one time, without any wisdom, I said, Well, look, I'm going to serve God whether you do or not. I said, If you want to go out the door, there's the door. Don't let it hit you in the back end when you walk out. That's how... I have made up my mind. You might say, that's not a way to talk to your wife. When it comes down to the choice between God and my wife, I'll take God any day. But I love my wife, and she knows that. And I've said too much, I'm already in trouble. Such good words here today. I mean, good testimonies. And like it says, they obtained a good report. And so to, that just kind of got my spirit, you know. I am serving the Lord because I know no matter what the world says, what the doctor says, what my bank account says, what my kids do, what my grandkids end up doing, I will obtain a good report. Man, that's just, that's good stuff. Um, the uh, offering plate is going to, is at the back when you guys leave. We're just going to do it that way. That way it's less touching and stuff. But, um. So glad you all are here again. Happy Grandparents Day to all of you that are grandparents. This is my first year, so I'm excited. <laughs> um, it's been so good. So we're going to let Brother Justin come and give us a good word today. Don't forget to pray for your pastors through the week. Lots of things going on. This world is getting hard. We love you guys so much. We pray for you guys so much. Just lift us up in prayer. Amen. Thank you all. I was glad when he said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Make sure to tell somebody about our service. I know COVID has hit us a little hard on our attendance. And I believe we have one of the best churches around. Um, and we need, to, we need to share that and encourage people. Um, and just let people know that there's a church that loves them and a church that cares for them. And, yes. and Ruby's going to hand out some stuff. But if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Psalms, the 94th chapter. 
while you're finding that we, we only our printer we're going to get a new printer this week our printer's been having problems so we had, wasn't able to do bulletins and i had to fight to get 13 copies of this so you might have to share but be good we'll be, psalms the 94th chapter It's so easy to get, if you miss church, Peggy and I was talking, and I know Sister West and I have talked about this. It's so easy if you miss a few services, it, it, it becomes too easy to miss more, and you start missing it, and before long, you're, you found yourself in a, in, a, in a lot less supportive state because there is support in the church and those around you. Psalms 94, we're going to begin at the 14th verse. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance, but judgment shall return unto righteousness, and all the upright in heart shall follow it. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers, or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless, somebody say unless, the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. He was basically saying, if it had not been for God, I never would have made it. Look at your neighbor as you're being seated and say, I never would have made it. I never would have made it. I want to encourage you today that, you know, we talk about all the things and the good testimonies and that we have heard today. But have you ever really considered and looked back over things in your life and wondered how you made them through? How did I make it through it? How, how did I make it through that hard time? How did I make it through that time of my life or that issue or that circumstance? We've made it through years and we look at 20 and 20 and say, how have we made it so far? We, we see all the bad reports and we see all the bad news going on and we see everything that's bad, but yet here you are. Look at your neighbor and say, you're still here. Through, through loss, through financial issues, through sickness, through a changed and charged culture and society, pro uh, protesting and riots and all the stuff, through church shutdown, but yet we here we stand today still holding on. The devil may look and think that he has us in our crosshairs because it by, by perception, and by the way it looks, sometimes it looks bad in your life. It looks bad when you get a bad doctor's report. It looks bad when your children are not serving God. It looks bad when your bank account is down to its last dollar. It looks bad when you lose your job. It looks bad when, when your, your family's having issues or your marriage is having issues. It looks bad when the doctor puts a, 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 an x-ray or a, a, a CAT scan or an MRI and says there's no hope for what we can do. Things look bad. Bad. America at times looked bad politically and, and, and culturally, a mess at what's going on. Friends and family are at odds right now. If you're red, if you're blue, if you, if you like this person or if you like that person, even families are being divided. And, and all these things look bad. But I ask you, how did you make it through? Because I, I hear you over and over testimonies and I hear Brother West's testimony and I'll hear Sister Eula May's testimony and I'll hear Stella's testimony and I'll hear Brother Beasley's or Dale's or Peggy's or everyone in this uh, uh, church house, I've heard your testimony. And there are things that you probably shouldn't have made it through. There, there's cancer that you shouldn't have made it through. There's, there's children issues we shouldn't have made it through. There's if, if we read the newspaper, there's thousands that ain't made it through. There's hundreds that went through what you did and they're not still standing. What is the difference in our life that the world doesn't have? And I have to remind myself of this little psalmist that began to write. Psalms 90 through 94 is about the Israelites going through the wilderness. And they're talking and they're saying, if it had not been for God, we, wouldn't have, we would still be in Egypt. If it hadn't been for God, we would still be beaten and, and talked about. If it hadn't been for God, we would have been dead where we are. And I'm reminding ourselves today, if we would think back a little bit, where have you came from? But if not for God, where would you be? Amen? 
And, and we need to encourage ourselves. Brother Randall, it don't matter what happens in two weeks because I know that I can make it through it because God's with me. It don't matter what happens in a year from now. I, I don't know. I wish, you know, part of me wishes I could foretell the future, but then I probably wouldn't want to live. Amen? Because if you knew the hardships you're going on, you probably would end it now because you don't think you could make it through it. But every one of us that look through storms and trials and tribulations and say, boy, I don't know how I did it. It was just one day at a time trusting God. I thought I was going to lose my mind one day and I made it through the next. I thought I was going to lose everything one day and I look back and a week had passed. I look back and a month had passed. How did I make it? What are you telling me, Justin? I'm trying to encourage you today that whatever you're facing, you're going to make it through it. Don't give up. Don't lay it down. Don't walk away. Hold on. Why? Because I'm reminded that little psalmist he said, he said, I was young but now I'm old. And he said, I didn't know how to make it through Goliath, but I made it through. I didn't know how to make it through a Bathsheba, but I made it through. I didn't know how to make it through being hungry and desperate and and, and depressed in a cave but I made it through I don't know how I made it through Absalom but I made it through I don't know how I made it through time after time he said I was young but now I'm old and I'm here to tell somebody I made it through every one of those years because God was faithful I hadn't seen a seed forsaken or his, or his seed begging for bread why because he'd been faithful in my life help me preach look at your neighbor and say how did you make it how did you make it? Society says the Christian shouldn't be making it. The world says the Christian shouldn't be making it. You're, you're old fashioned. You're out of touch with reality. You, you're a nobody. You, you're, 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 you're nothing to America. You're nothing to the world. How are you still standing? You're, you're not a Muslim. You're not a minority. You're not some, some group in America that is singled out. How are you still standing? I'll tell you how. Because this thing's been tried or true over thousands of years. They thought they would sum it up in Genesis, but it was still going going in Exodus. They thought they'd get it when they walked through the Red Sea, but it was still going when, when Daniel was in Babylon. It was still going when Paul was, was uh, going into Corinth or going into Roman. It was still around, and it's going to be around until God says no otherwise and comes back. I thought about it. How have we made it? Here they are, the children of Israel, 40 years in the wilderness. They journeyed they went through it during this time. They were attacked by enemies and they had to go through Red Seas and Jordans and they had to go through times where they didn't have no food and had to rely on God. They had to go through times they didn't have no water. And because of their unwillingness to follow God to what he required, they had to keep wandering around in the desert. The Bible literally says they had to wander around because they could show no profit for their journey. You are going to keep going through the same trials, the same storms, the same tribulations until you realize how to benefit and learn from them. Because God cannot take you to where he needs you until you learn the basics. I, anybody went to school in here? We got one person in the back that went to school. Amen. I knew I was in the south but not the deep south. Come on. You did not show up in kindergarten and them teach you geometry. You did not show up in kindergarten and then put trig uh, in front of you and say solve it. You started in kindergarten and they taught you what one was and they taught you what two was. And then they taught you what to put them together. And you worked your way up because they knew you could never handle what you needed to handle and later on in life until you learned the basics. And this was the issue with the children of Israel. God said, I need to take you into a promised land. But to be great and to be the people that I've called you to be, you've got to learn how to just trust me. And they said, I, 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 I have a problem with trust. And they said, until you learn to trust, I can't bring great deliverance in your life and great things because I'm going to lead you through things that you don't even understand. And if you can't trust me through everything, then there's going to come some point in your life where you're going to walk away from me because you don't understand 
understand what I'm doing. So whenever you come to the Lord, God begins to work a work in you and he takes you from faith to faith, from glory to glory, from walk to walk until you look back and you can be where the men and women of God were in the Bible, where they learned and grew from that and said, listen, I never would have made it through one plus one if it had not been for God and I can make it through trigonometry or geometry because God has brought me every step of the way. And the children of Israel were walking around and the writer says, listen, I would have never made it. He says in Psalms 94, which I find interesting, he, he says that God uses the evil to chastise his children. Think about that a minute. It's not even part of the sermon, but it's a great tidbit. God uses the evil to chastise his children. Whenever we look at the world today, the evilness. God is using it to get his bride and his children ready. What do you mean? Because his children should hate evil. It should rub you the wrong way. You should look at it and it should make something uncomfortable in your life. And when it doesn't, it starts to separate the wheat from the tares, the sheep from the goat. Look at your neighbor and say, he just called you a goat. Come on. Why? Because God says, I've got to bring a sifting. And the only way I can bring a sifting is to bring evil and for you to figure out who you are. Are you a child of God that's going to trust me? Or are you one that wants to go with the flow and go with everything else? He said, I'm looking not for them. There's too many of them. I'm looking for the peculiar people, the people that are different, the people that are strange, the people that are crazy. Uh, see, that's why when, when they call us holy rollers, uh, we're, we're not offended by that. That's a nice term for us. Why? Because we have rolled around on some floors before. We've jumped on pews and we've walked on things. Why? Because we understand when you feel what we feel, you can't stand stand still. You can't hold it in. We know what an experience is with God. So the writer begins to tell about all that's going on from Psalms 90 to 94. How they, how they had to wake up each day and get manna, bread from heaven. How they had to follow the fire and the cloud. How they had to hold on day after day, long distances after long distances. And I thought about how if God hadn't been there, how would I have made it? But through their faith, what little bit it was, it don't require a lot, God provided for the children of Israel, and they did make it, those that wanted to. But the first thing you've got to realize how you've made it, I want to break it down because I think it's important. First, you've got to realize God is the giver of your daily bread. Write it down, mark it, highlight it, it's in there, I think, in your notes. Make sure you understand. How do you make it? First and foremost, God is giver of the daily bread. You do not wake up. You do not have the ability to function unless God gives it. You are not old life. Now, the Constitution says that that life gives you liberty and it gives you some, some built-in privilege in your life. But you've got to realize you are not old life. If you don't believe me, go up to the cemeteries and talk to them about it. Your life is a blessing to the world right now. Come on. Come on. You ever heard anybody tell somebody they're a waste of breath? It's not a nice thing, right? But what they're saying is you're a waste to life. God has given you the daily bread. Every one of us. He wakes us up not just to be kind to us, but he wakes us up because he has purpose for us. And he has desires for us. And he takes it. Now listen. He takes it that if he wakes you up, then he's invested in you. Come on. And if he's invested in me, it is his responsibility to take care of me. I am his child. You got to get this. Come on. How are we making it? First and foremost, because he is the giver of the daily bread. He is the one that daily, he, he, he's not worried about having to give, take care of us day by day. You know, some of us wait for our kids to get old enough so we don't have to take care of them, right? 
Come on. No matter if they're 40 years old, right? I'm still waiting on some of them to, so you don't have to take care of them, right? Come on, I'm being honest with you. God doesn't mind. If he minded, he would have given the children of Israel enough bread to get them through the 40 years at one moment, right? Could you imagine them wake up and say, I don't want to take care of you every day. Here's 40 years. I'm done with you. You manage it and move on. God says, I want to take care of you. So every day I'm going to wake you up and I'm going to feed you. I'm going to make sure. It doesn't end. The Bible says that he knows the hairs on your head, Joe. He knows how to take care of us. He knows how to care for us. You've got to trust him that he loves you enough to take care of you. He is the giver of your daily bread. Look at your neighbor and say, he's the giver of your daily bread. When we understand that first basic thing, until we wake up no more every day, when I wake up, if I'm a child of the king, I say, Lord, give me that daily bread. That's why, that's why the prayer even exists. Lord, give me this daily bread. Why? Because without it, I can't make it. Without it, I can't exist. You have to wake yourself up every morning realizing that you're going to make it that day because he woke you up and he gave you the enough sufficient grace and mercy and goodness to make it through the day. But what happens is the enemy comes and what does he do? He brings dread for the day. He brings fear for the day. I heard a TV uh, uh, show, the guy pulled up and his kids were out the window and he looked at them and he, he said, he said, they were wanting him and he rose up the window and he goes, can't I just get one day without a crisis? <laughs> I told Ruby, I said, that's how I feel. One day without a crisis. Come on. You know how when you was younger, you know, you was off doing everything, you didn't care about the crisis going on. Right. Right. You just out living life. You're young. Let, let, the, let the old man and women deal with the crisis. And now that you're older, you deal with the crisis. Right, Peggy? You know what I'm talking about, right? Every day. Who, who am I going to have to bail out? Who am I going to have to help? Who am I going to have to rescue? Who am I going to have to... What is going to go wrong today that I have to take care of? Why? Because the enemy wants to bring that fear. We have given up on the daily bread giver. I'm preaching better than you letting on. Come on. First of all, do you realize that you can't even get a breath of air without the Lord giving it to you? You're going to make it because he's the giver of your daily bread. We are naturally alive because of him, but you know what else he says? In John 10 and 10, he says, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. How do you have more abundant life? is because you are living a better and more fulfilling life than the world is living. And when we fail to do that, we fail to give justice to who God is in our life. That means you've got to have purpose. Look at your neighbor and say, I need some purpose. Your purpose is not just to take care of your children. Come on. Oh, you just didn't like that. Now, understand, I'm the first one to run to rescue my children, and it happens a lot. But I am not here to just take care of my children. My children at some point become adults, and they think they know what they're doing. At some point, my purpose shifts. Come on. Because I have seen people, now I'm going to preach for them. I'm not even on my notes, not in your notes. I'm going to preach. I'm going to get on your toes. Lift up your feet if you don't get toe punched today. Listen, I have seen people that their whole life was invested in their children. Everything they are, who they are. And when it shifts and messes up and doesn't go like that, they crumble. Because their existence was not based on who God had made them. All right, all right, all right. Come on. But because... They had gotten invested in the worldly things. My job is to raise my children the best I can, to train them right, to be there as I can. But you know what? That's also my job for you all. My job is to train you all and to teach you all and to help you all grow. You all are spiritually my children. Come on. And, and, and I can get so invested in Brother West, but if Brother West wants to go out and live like hell all the time, that I'm out chasing him all the time and I forget about you all, you're going to feel left out, right? 
Because I will tell you this, you can chase after one so much that it requires all of your time, all of your direction, all of your focus, and you miss what the rest is trying to do in your life. Come on. Come on, that's free right there. Listen, I want to ask you, I'll put a question in there, write it down. Are you living life to its fullness? It's in your handout. I want you to think about that. Don't just write it down and say yes or no. I want you to think about it. Are you living life to its fullest? The Lord's been really, really pulling on me about living our life to its fullest. How did the children of Israel, not only did they have the giver of the daily bread, how are you going to make it through tomorrow because you've got the giver of the daily bread, but also God protected Israel against enemies. They were able to walk through the Red Sea when Pharaoh was over them. They were able to face enemy after enemy because God was their protection. I've come to tell somebody today God's protecting you. Come on. That needs to be said again. God is protecting you. God is protecting you. If it had not been, in Psalms 124, write it down. It's, I think it's in your notes too. David said, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they that swallowed us up quick when their wrath was kindled against us. See, you survive because God has something in store for you. There's a promised land waiting for you. And you can rest assured you're going to make it through 20 and 20. You're going to make it through the next year and the years that God has called you. Not because Trump loves you or Biden loves you. Not because the government loves you or because you, you know, you're, you're a good person. You're going to make it through because you're a child of the king. And there's no weapon formed against you that can prosper when you realize who you are in the name of Jesus. We got to realize, you know, God's protecting us. There's some supernatural protection that God does. Think about this. Do you all feel like you're somebody in the Lord? I got five. Everybody feel like you're somebody in the Lord? Come on. Come on. I didn't ask if you was greatly anointed or if you felt like you floated to the bathroom every morning. That's not what I asked. Are you a child of the King? If you are, then the word of God tells us. Do you believe the word of God? The word of God tells you that the devil hates you. Think about this. Does everybody believe there's a devil? Have you seen physically the devil? You've seen his work. Do you believe the devil can work and you not see it physically? Behind the scenes which makes the devil a spiritual enemy. A spiritual enemy is impossible for you in yourself, in your natural human form, to counter. Come on. If somebody breaks in Pearl's house and Randall, you know, Pearl knocks him out of the bed and says, Shh, honey, somebody's in the, bed, in the house. Randall's going to pull about one of his 50 guns he's got by his nightstand. stand. He's going to put his Trump hat on and he's going to go face that enemy, right? He ain't going to get him in a headlock if he sees him. Now imagine you hear a noise. Loud noise. Pearl says, honey, somebody's in the house. Trump puts, uh, uh, he puts his Trump hat on. He gets his lapel. He gets his guns. He walks in there and he can't find anybody. Because he looks through his physical eyes. So he needs supernatural help either to expose the vision or to fight the fight for him. And that's why the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a stand. We need super, what am I trying to tell you? We need supernatural intervention. Because the enemy hates you. He hates each one of us. Why? Because you are the child of a king. And the enemy is a bully like you ain't never seen. And he wants to bully and fight and come against and I'm telling you that if you've made it this far, it's because you have had supernatural, unseen help to make it. Even if you ain't seen it, it's been there. Because it's impossible to get as far as you are in life as a child of the king. It is impossible without God sending supernatural help.
Peggy Dale wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that supernatural help. We know that. I wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. That telephone pole would have took you out if it had not been for supernatural help to lead us through. And I want to tell you, God is going to protect you through whatever comes in your future. It's important. I, I want you to have some, some hope, some faith. It, it's too easy. It's too easy for us to get wrapped up in the enemy's works and forget how powerful God really is. Hollywood has done us a disservice. Why? Because they have taught us to get wrapped up in a fantasy world and we lose sight of really how powerful God is. Imagine the movies where they, you know, where, where in the Avengers, if you watch the Avengers, Thanos flips his finger and half of, a, of, of the world, you know, disappears. Well, I've got news for you. God don't even have to flip his finger to make it happen. The Hollywood and the world wants to try to describe to you how powerful the God you serve is. But he can move a mountain at your word. He can cast it into the furthest sea with your word. He is a God that shows up time and time again supernaturally in your life. It's okay. Embrace what God can do in your life. Come on. How do we also make it through? Because he provides for us. Look at your neighbor and say, he provides for us. Did you, can you get over, you know, Ruby doesn't like it because what happens, she'd buy me clothes and I'd go to work like these khakis and I'd come back with big stains on them. And her whole, you know, she'd get really mad. Say, I don't know what you do all day, but every pair of pants you come home and you run. You know what I'm talking about? You, 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 get, you buy nice clothes and they last, what, six months anymore? And you pay, you know. Clothes aren't made like what they, they used to be. But you know what the Bible tells us? He provided for the children of Israel so much that the clothes they had on when they came out was just as good as the clothes, uh, just as good 40 years later when they walked out. How many got clothes you've been wearing for 40 years? You and has got one pair. 40 years. And we think we have to wear new clothes every day. 40 years. God took care of them. Why? Because God didn't want them having to worry about chasing down sheep and, and shearing them and making clothes. God needed them to be flexible to move. Come on. God wanted them to be able to move. You get this? He said, take no thought for tomorrow because if you're thinking about tomorrow, you're not going to move. When he said move. If, if you were sleeping good and that, that pillar of fire come up in the middle of the night and said move, and it started moving away, you chased it down. You pulled down your tent and you loaded up the caravan and you kicked the camel and said, let's go. Why? Because you knew God had everything else. Jensen doesn't worry. He wakes up. He knows his mama. All he worries about is telling his mama what he wants. And he doesn't have to worry about anything else. Clothes are washed, put away. Food is delivered. Why? Because he knows he's the child of somebody that loves him and provides for him. But how many of us worry about tomorrow? Come on. We all do. We worry about it. And what those does, you know what those do? They put weights on us. They weigh you down. Now, I can't preach about Joe because he got up moved when God said move, right? But a lot of us, you all move. A lot of us are like, no, no, no. I got everything. I, I, I can't move like that anymore. I'm too set, right? But God doesn't want us to have strains of this world that hold us down, whatever it is. Because if God wants you to move up in levels, sometimes you've got to let go of what's holding you back. And so God will provide for you. You've got to let God provide. I know it may not be the Cadillac that you've been wanting, but he'll provide. I tell the story often. Ruby, Ruby has this knack. I don't she ain't used it in a while, but she probably should use it. But she has this knack where she will tell the Lord what she wants and God will deliver. It's almost like, you know, like an Uber service. God just delivers it. She wanted a sectional solfus one time. We didn't have no money. And she's like, honey, I want, I want a sectional sofa. And I'm like, honey, those things are like two grand, 1500 I said, I ain't got that kind of money. We, we was literally sitting. This ain't been too long ago. We were literally sitting on, on cement blocks 
and an old couch that mom and dad had had that was about 25 years old, and he lost those little little footsies, so we had to sit on a concrete block just to make, come on, I'm not lying to you. And Ruby's sitting on there one day, uncomfortable as can be, sitting there saying, boy, I would like a sectional. And I'm looking at her like I literally had no money. I was literally living off credit cards because I'd come back from pastoring, working at a car lot, trying to sell cars. And if you don't lie, Brother Randall might back me up here. If you don't lie, it's hard to sell cars. And, and, and so I was losing money like crazy. And I, I, I mean, I was, living, I was driving a car dad and mom bought. I was sitting on the sofa mom and dad bought in a house that mom and dad owned. And I, I, here I am, a grown 35-year-old guy thinking, boy, I'm back in my mom's basement. And I, I'd sit there and I was like, ma'am. And Ruby's like, boy, I'd like a sex show. It was not. I said, honey, we ain't got that kind of money. She goes, well, I'll just pray about it. It wasn't literally two or three hours later, her cousin Messenger and say, hey, I got this brand new sexual. I bought it and didn't like it. Do you want it for free? I looked at her and said, what? We'd come back from Pennsylvania. Ruby loved this baloney out in Pennsylvania called Schaefer's Baloney. And this has been like three or four years ago, maybe maybe six or seven. She just said, boy, I would like some, some Schaefer's Baloney. So I thought, I'll get on there and look. And it was like $200 to ship it down. I was like, man, I can't afford that for a, for a you know, thing of baloney. Uh, Baloney's like, you know, go to uh, Oscar Mayer and get it for, you know, $1.50 a pack. But she really wanted that baloney. I'm not lying to you. About a week later, UPS delivers her two big loaves of Schaefer's baloney from somebody in Pennsylvania who said they were just thinking about her. I, I, what are you saying? Uh, Papal always told me, he said, Justin, he said, if you need a refrigerator, don't expect God to give you $2,000 to go buy a refrigerator because you probably won't buy the refrigerator. You'll probably go waste the money on something else. God will give you a refrigerator. If you need a count, if you need a meal, he'll give you the meal. You know, you, you're like some of these ho uh, homeless people that are homeless but drive a nicer car than you on the, uh, you know, parked at the Walmart, and, and they're out there wanting money, and you offer them a job or offer them food, and they don't want that. They want the cash. That's how you are. God, I, I need a really, I want a good meal today. I really need that meal, but... Lord, just give me the money and I'll take care of the rest. You know, that's how it is. We need to understand that God will provide by giving us what he needs. That's that daily bread. Lord, Lord, if you think I need a, 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 a you know, a bologna instead of a steak, let me learn to love bologna then. If you think I need a hard time more than I need a mountain right now, Lord, let me learn to love the valley. If you think I need a, a storm more than I need some victory, let me learn to storm, love the storm because I know you love me. And whatever you're taking, me through is going to lead me to good things in my life. Look at your neighbor and say, he's going to provide for you. So look at, look at, look at your neighbor and say, you're going to have a lot more baloney in your life if you let God provide. A lot less worry. The last thing, you know what God, how he helps us through? He saved the children of Israel from foolishness. God helps us make it through because he saves us from our foolishness. What do you mean? Yes, you can be foolish at your age. Come on. You can be foolish at your age. Because none of us are as mature as we should be in Christ. None of us are. And we all get ourselves in foolish predicaments. Sister West is over there. She gets it. Facebook helps us get a lot more foolish predicaments, don't it? Right, Sister Wes? What are you saying, Justin? I'm saying I can't tell you the times that I get myself into situations. And I think, why would I do that? Why did I say, come on, Brother Randall, you get me, right? Why? Because we are still growing. Brother B's, at your age, you're still growing. We're still maturing. We're still learning. We're still going through things. We're still receiving, learning how to do things. But God saves us a lot of times from the ramifications of those foolishness. Why? Because he sends help and works it out. How do you know? Because I will tell you this, I worry about a whole bunch of stuff. Justin, this week, I spent a whole week trying to work up an argument about something that may not even become a fight later on. What do you mean? I'm sitting there saying, okay, I'm going to tell them this, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to do this, and and I'm thinking, well, what if they don't even mind? Well, no, 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 I'm going to do this. And I'm, they're going to really hate this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I work up all these things in my mind. Right? Come on. Maybe you ain't like that. I play scenarios in my mind that may not ever happen, but I got them up here if you ever encounter them. Why? 
because I think I got to be ready for whatever I get myself into. Anybody don't, come on, maybe you don't understand. Maybe you just go through life and not even worry, and whatever comes, comes, praise the Lord for you. But what, I even forgot what I was going to say, but what you got to understand. Oh, yes, I, you know, I, I, we worry about so much in life. How much of that really happens? If you would say out of 100% of what you worry about, honestly, what percentage actually happens? How many is worried that you're going to be broke and homeless in here ever in your life? Nobody ever worried? Well, I, man, I worry about that all the time. Every hamburger I buy, I cook at, I'm like, this is putting me out of, this make me go file bankruptcy. Come on. Worry about losing your pension. Have you lost it yet? How many worry that Medicare is going to end on you? There we go. I got one. Has it ended on you yet? I would bet you money, if I look back at my life, maybe maybe 10% of what I worried about ever happened. But it caused me 90% grief and stress and anxiety. Why? Because God saves us from all those worries. That's why he says worry not. But if we could ever learn to stop worrying, right? I bet you've worried over your kids a lot more of things that never happened, right? How, okay, let me, you all women, you, you, you worry about your kids all the time. I know this. How many times did you worry when it was out late that they were in some sort of danger? All the time. Maybe 10% was accurate. Little bit of was accurate. Why? Because we build scenarios in our mind. And we think that everything hates us and everything's out to get us and everything's going to bring us down. Why? Because ultimately we don't understand that we're going to make it through because God loves us and he cares for us. If it does happen, I'm going to trust him. But I can't let my mind, and this is hard, we've got to learn to cast down every vain imagination that wants to exalt itself above God. What do you mean exalt itself above God? I'm not talking even lust or perversion. If it says you're going under, it's trying to exalt itself above who God is. If it says you're going to, you know, when Ruby got pregnant, we were moved, started pastoring. And, and this was before they removed precondition, uh, pre-existing conditions in insurance, if you know anything about insurance. Basically, it meant she had already had a C-section. So what they told her was that they would not cover it. The insurance company would not cover it because it was a pre-existing condition. And they said it would be about twenty something thousand dollars for her uh, insurance won't cover it. Twenty thousand something dollars for her to have a C-section. I was pastoring, making you know thirty thirty something thousand a year, and 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 I didn't have that kind of thing to absorb. And I just sit and cry, like Lord, this is going to put me under. Nobody wants a pastor that lives under the bridge. You know, I was worried, stressed. I mean, I was worked up. I was sick to my stomach. I called mom. I was like, mom, I can't do this. You know, I'm going to have to leave the pastor and try to find some health insurance or take a second job or do something that some find something that would cover Ruby or some second job. And I remember it was, I, I'd worried for about two or three days, just worried, 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 worried. Didn't do a lot of praying. I worried a lot. And I remember that I got a phone call from one of our elders. He goes, hey, pastor, believe it or not, I found an insurance company that's going to cover you and Ruby, and it's not going to cost you. I think it cost us $250. For the whole pregnancy. I wasted days. Ulcers were formed because of that pregnancy. But it never happened. I'm trying to encourage you, believe it or not. Stop worrying. Even if it's a small amount. You're not ever going to be able to solve 100% of your worries. It's just the world we live in. But if you can just solve a small... I mean, honestly, if you think about your day, your mental stress... Probably a third of it to half of it is built on stress. Just worrying, setting, you see something. You know, if you're Randall watching, you know, CNN, it's probably 99% stress. But, but you know, it, 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 if we can just understand that just limit a little bit of it, our life would be so much better and trust God. Amen? Just, just cut out a little bit. Look at your neighbor and say, just stop a little bit of it. Stop worrying just a little bit. It'll be so much better. I just want to encourage you. God is going to provide for you. He's going to keep the foolishness out of your life when you trust him and serve him. I just wanted today to tell you if it had not been for God, you wouldn't have made it. And how did you make it? Because of God. 
and you're going to make it through. I'm going to see you all in December, and we're going to all be still hanging on. Yes, even if Biden gets in, Randall, we're going to be hanging on. We'll still be there. Why? Because he's still God. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. We're, we're going to thank the Lord for a moment as we close this service. Thousands of years have been going on. 66 books in that Bible, and God took care of hundreds and thousands. Churches are full across America because God takes care of his own. And as we close in prayer, I heard a, heard a, a new uh, statistic yesterday that because of COVID, the financial strains and things, that 20% of all churches they're predicting will be closed by the end of the year. Churches have moved online. People are not giving. And that's a sad state if it's true. But I think what's going to happen is I think you're going to lose a filtering. I think there's that sifting that the churches that really are not grounded are going to, they're, they're not going to see the benefit financially and they're going to have to close. We're going to still be here. But, but I encourage you, let's pray for those churches because if that's true, that means 20% of those, you know, those churches, those population are, are, are you know, people. I, 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 the, that same study said that one, uh, and Peggy will probably back me up here, I think it said one in four are not coming back to church since, since COVID shut them down because you get back into the routine and it's hard to get back. We need the Lord right now. We need him more than we ever have if we're going to make it. So I ask that you pray this week. Pray that God will send a reviving across his people. That those that have sat at home, gotten too comfortable watching streaming. And streaming's great. But there's something to be had for being in a presence where you feel the charged atmosphere. And so I encourage you. If you, if you see somebody that's, that's hard to get their engine running again on Sundays, go get them. You've got my permission to beat them up a little bit, throw them in the car, kidnap them. You know, you got a mask on. They won't know who you are. Just put your mask on. Go get them. They, they won't know. And uh, get them to church. They'll be thankful when they get here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for what we feel in this house from the testimonies, the songs, and the word. Lord, And we never would have made it if it hadn't been for you. Let us think back at all the, the diseases, the sicknesses, the relationships, the illnesses, the worries, the stress, the times of anxiousness. How, if you had not been on our side, where would we be? Lord, I thank you that nobody here is in a ditch. Nobody in here is by the roadside with no hope. That we are here today with hope and with strength and with love, believing in a God that takes care of his children. Lord, I ask that this week you just help us with our worry and our stress and let us trust you for that daily bread, that you'll be the supernatural provision and you'll be the supernatural protection. Lord, and the enemy wants to destroy, he wants to come and take away. The thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy, but you, Lord, have come that we may have life and have it more abundantly, Lord. And we're going to have that more abundant life. We want to fulfill life at its fullest. Lord, and as I ask that question, is it written in their handbook? Lord, this week let them just get into your word and ask that question am I living my life to its fullest Lord I want us all to be a church members and congregation and children of God that we can say yes I am living this life to its fullest and Lord I thank you Lord for purpose and I ask that you give us each a magnified purpose in our life Lord that we can go about and share the gospel to the lost to the hurting and to the dying world I thank you, Lord. I speak traveling mercies upon each person. I speak blessings upon them. Lord, and I speak every attack of the enemy to be canceled by the name of Jesus. Lord, I speak it right now that angels go forth with us, Lord, and protect us and guide us. And, Lord, your word be the driving force between, behind us every day. And that we get into that word and we study your word and learn from it. And we praise you in the name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen. God bless you. We love you. You can shake some hands. No, don't shake hands. You can, you can point your finger at somebody and say, I love you. God bless you.